Thank you very much, Jim. It's a huge pleasure to be here. So what I want to ask over the next 20 minutes is a, a simple but fundamental question, which is why do businesses exist? Is it to earn profit or is it to serve a purpose? Do businesses exist for shareholders or for society, customers, employees, and the environment? Well, the conventional view is exclusively to earn profit. And that's not as narrow-minded as it sounds, because to earn profit, a company is forced to care about society. It has to make high-quality products, or customers will stop buying. It has to treat its workers well, or they'll leave. And it can't pollute the environment, or its brand will be hurt. Indeed, leading economist Milton Friedman, he once famously wrote that the social responsibility of business is to increase profit. Right? Firms benefit society just by making as much money as possible. So if that is true, we just head to the land of profit, and then we'll get all of the other decisions right. But that's only a theory. What happens in practice? Well, in practice, it's really hard to reduce every decision to a mathematical calculation. So let's take Marks & Spencer, the UK high street store. Now, former chairman Simon Marks, he had a policy where all senior management had to walk around the shop floor to see firsthand how customers and, and workers were being treated. And one day, back in the 1930s, in one of his own visits, Simon sees a shop assistant faint. And he's concerned, and he wants to find out why. And it turns out the husband's unemployed, and she's not eating so that her family can. So the very next week, Simon launches a policy to provide nutritious meals to his staff at nominal prices. Why? Well, Milton Friedman would say, do a calculation. Right? If I provide nutritious meals, this many workers won't faint, so I'm going to make this much more money. But there's obviously no way you can calculate that number. Instead, Simon's thinking was simple. I'll provide nutritious meals, even if it costs me a bit, because I care about my workers and I want them to eat well. And so that's the second view, which many of us subscribe to. It's called corporate social responsibility. Now, many outside this room, they see it as tree-huggy and out of touch, but it's actually not too different from the first view. It agrees that profit is a good thing, but profit is only a byproduct it's not the end goal. Instead, businesses exist to serve a purpose, to make products that transform customers' lives for the better, to provide employees with a healthy and enriching workplace, and to preserve the environment for future generations. And they do that even if they can't calculate the bottom line impact of doing so. So let's take George Merck. He was the president of Merck Pharmaceuticals. Now, his mindset wasn't how to make as much money as possible selling pharmaceuticals but it was how to use science to save people's lives. Now, back in 1942, penicillin was still a new drug. It hadn't been made outside the lab before. It was too expensive. But George takes a punt, and Merck becomes the first company ever to make penicillin. Now, this is a photo of Ann Miller. She's a 33-year-old woman. She lives in New Haven, Connecticut. And she's married to Ogden Miller, who's the Yale University Athletics Director. But on March the 14th, 1942, Anne lies dying in a hospital bed. She's stricken with streptococcal septicemia, which she's contracted after suffering a miscarriage. Her temperature has hit 104 to 106 for 11 straight days. And everything the doctors have tried has failed. Until penicillin. Thanks to Merck, Anne becomes the first American ever to be treated with penicillin, and it saves her life. The very next day, her temperature's down to normal. She makes a complete recovery. She goes on to having three sons, and she lives until 90 years old. And then George Merck then shares the secrets of how to make penicillin with his competitors, so that his competitors could also make penicillin, saving thousands of lives in World War II. As George Merck said, we try never to forget that medicine is for the people. It is not for the profit. The profits follow, 
But if we have remembered that, they have never failed to appear. So what am I telling you? Just serve a purpose and the prophets will follow. It's too good to be true. Right? It's a nice idea, but where is the evidence? So that's what I set out to gather. I wanted to test whether socially responsible firms actually perform better or are they fluffy companies who are instead distracted from the bottom line. But how do you measure social responsibility? I chose to focus on employee well-being. Now, that's not the only dimension that's important. There's customers and the environment. But I chose employee well-being because there is a very good measure available, which is the list of the 100 best companies to work for in America, latterly published in Fortune magazine. Now, this list is available from 1984, so I have tons of data. And it's also really thorough. It looks at not only quantitative factors, like pay and benefits, but also qualitative factors like trust in management, pride in your jobs, and camaraderie with your colleagues. So what I did is I looked at the effect of being a great place to work on your future stock returns. But how do I know that your high stock returns are because you're a great place to work? Right? It could be that your industry happened to perform well, or some other factor. So to isolate the effect of employee well-being, I control for what industry you're in, for size, for growth opportunities, for dividends, and a whole host of other factors. And as we know, correlation doesn't imply causation. So I do some other tests to suggest that it's employee well-being that leads to better performance, rather than better performance allowing a company to spend on employee well-being. So it took four years to complete the study, to verify the robustness of the results, and to rule out alternative explanations. What did I find? Well, I found that the 100 best companies to work for in America beat their peers by 2 to 3% per year over a 28-year period. So that's 84 to 140% cumulative. So in short, companies that treat their workers better do better. And I think this fundamentally changes the way that companies should think about their workers. You might think, isn't it obvious that companies should do better if their workers are happier? But it's not obvious. Because treating your workers well is costly. Take Costco, for example, the, the American supermarket. Now, Costco pays its workers $20 per hour. Its rivals pay 11, and it gives 90% of its workers health care. That's all expensive, and it drives investors crazy, right? This equity analyst quoted in Business Week said Costco's management is focused on workers to the detriment of shareholders. Why would I want to pay a, buy a stock which is paying double what it should be for its workers? And indeed, this is the conventional view, right? Any pound that you give to your workers is a pound taken away from shareholders. So you want to pay your workers as little as possible and work them as hard as possible. Just like a great football manager squeezes that little bit extra from his players. Right? So the view is that great managers are ones that get their workers to work really, really hard. And this is something I was the recipient of. So as Jim was suggesting, before my current life of poverty, I, I used to be an investment banker at Morgan Stanley. And as you can see from the microwavable ready meals in the bottom corner, I was a junior analyst, so right at the bottom of the totem pole. And one day in the office, the vice president catches me laughing. And he says, Alex, do not laugh when you're in the office. I am banning you from laughter. I asked, why? And he said, because if you're too happy, the managing director will think, I am not a good boss because I'm not working you hard enough. So this is like very serious. This is how many workers managers like to be seen as squeezing as much as possible out of their workers because that is good management. But my results suggest the opposite is, the tr is true. Right? Instead, treating your workers eth ethically actually pays off in terms of high returns. As Costco CFO Richard Galanti said, from day one, we've run the business with the philosophy that if we pay better than average, provide a salary people can live on, have a positive environment and good benefits, we'll be able to hire better people, 
they'll stay longer, and they'll be more efficient. Now, I've only looked at one dimension of corporate social responsibility. That is employee well-being, but as I mentioned, there's other dimensions. But the results are consistent regardless of what dimension you look at. So we can also look at customer satisfaction. The American Customer Satisfaction Index, the top solid line, that's the returns to companies which score high on that dimension. And that's much higher than the dotted line, which is the industry average. And some of you will know my colleague, Yanis Yanu, who's also a professor at London Business School. And what he and two co-authors at Harvard looked at was companies that adopted high sustainability policies. They care about something other than directly the bottom line. And as you can see with the comparison of the yellow and the green lines, companies with high sustainability policies significantly outperform. Here at Stock Returns, he also found the same for other results like accounting profit and so forth. And as Jim was saying, right, Lord Brown said uh, a couple of weeks ago that 30% of a company's value depends on how it engages with society. Right, so these findings, these are incredibly freeing because they suggest that just doing good does pay off. Right? You don't need to make a calculation. You don't need to expect anything in return. We can do things for intrinsic and not instrumental value. Because even though financial returns were not the motive for acting ethically, they typically manifest anyway. Caring about society is not at the expense of profit, it supports profit. Now what I've talked about so far is the implications for managers, but I know that some people in this room are investors. I'm gonna spend the last seven minutes or so talking about the implications for people who invest. Now as investors, you have the power to put your money in stocks that reflect what you would like to see in the world. Now, the conventional view is that if you invest in ethical stocks, you have to sacrifice financial returns. But the results suggest there is no sacrifice. Investing in companies that are socially responsible to employees or to customers or other dimensions does pay off in terms of higher returns. So investors can both do good and do well. And more generally, the results suggest a shift in thinking, a new way of thinking about how we choose stocks. When we choose a stock, it's tempting to look at price-earnings ratios and earnings and dividends. Right? These are easily available on Yahoo Finance. But because this data is so easy to gather, other investors are gathering it as well. So we can't get a competitive advantage. So we should shift our attention from the short term and the quantitative to the long-term and the qualitative, some of the most important dimensions of a company's value. It's corporate culture, it's customer loyalty, it's innovative capability, simply not captured in these short-term numbers. Because just because social responsibility can't be quantified, it doesn't mean it can't be measured. There's many measures out there such as true cost and sustain analytics, they measure environmental sustainability, asset for and cal that have a whole host of other responsibility dimensions. Some people look at this chart and they think, who? But that's precisely the point. Right? Many investors have not heard about this information, even though it's so thorough, because they're so focused on quantitative numbers. So because other investors don't gather this information, if you choose to do so, this can give you a competitive advantage. Indeed, I find that perhaps because the market is so short-termist, perhaps because the market is so focused on numbers, perhaps because the market, like that equity analyst in Business Week, wrongly thinks that employee-friendly companies are tree-huggy, I find that it takes the market four to five years before it incorporates the benefits of employee well-being into the stock price. So you could buy the best companies three years too late and still earn high returns. So think long-term value, not short-term numbers. And some of you may have seen this article in the FT that Yanis alerted me to called Quants are the new ethical investors, right? So now even investors who only care about financial returns, they don't care about social good, even those investors are now caring about ethical dimensions because they realize that number one, ethical behavior does pay off in the long run, and number two, ethical behavior is not taken into account by other investors. 
Similarly, we shouldn't dump stocks at the first sign of trouble. Investing in your workers takes many, many years to appear, and the costs appear uh, immediately. So if we dump stocks at the sign of first sign of trouble, we pressure managers to focus on the short term. So it is our responsibility as investors to support management's pursuit of the long term by investing and looking for the long term ourselves. And indeed, many of you know, well, Paul Polman of Unilever, he stopped reporting quarterly earnings to allow him to focus on long-term value. And it's no surprise that they're one of the leading investors behind sustainability today, for example, designing shampoos to use less water. And one of their own investors is Alliance Trust. Right, they've been around since 1888. And some investors who held shares back then passed them through generations, and those shares remain with the same family today and that allows them to take a long-term perspective. And that's not at the expense of, of profit. Right? They've increased their dividend every year for the past 48 years. Indeed, if you had 100 pounds worth of Alliance Trust shares back in 1888, that would have been worth 18 and a half million pounds with dividends reinvested in 2015. If this were to scale, that green bar would be 30 times the height of the shot. So just to speak in the interest of time, I'll go back to get into the, with the conclusion. And let's go back to the question I started with, which is why do businesses exist? Is it to earn profit or is it to serve a purpose? Is it for shareholders or is it for society? Customers, employees, and the environment. Well, what is the answer? The answer is yes. You know, I think, how can you answer yes to a, a multiple choice question? <clears throat> well, because it's not multiple choice. Because it's not zero sum and it's not either or. Because it's both and. Businesses exist to serve a purpose. And by doing so, and only by doing so, will they generate profits in the long run. To reach the land of profit, follow the road of purpose. Thank you for your attention.